A note to listeners, the following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. John was number six in the lineup. Clarence was number seven, and my mother was number 10. So very large family. I have been experiencing Alcatraz all of my life. At first, the FBI was very harsh on the family. Some of the stories that we can get into that I know happened, I know several FBI agents who came to our house well, as I grew up. Uh, questioning my mom over the number of years. And then eventually the U.S. Marshals took over and they, we, we thought pretty much we had been left alone at that time. And you know, we find out years later that we were actually being surveilled. Uh, we were actually being followed and, and our phones were actually being tapped. One of the one of the individuals made a very disparaging comments about my uncles. You know, basically said, "Well, the whole thing was constructed by Frank Morris and John and Clarence were third you know, grade educated hicks, and they were lucky to be included." And yeah, I just got so mad. I said, "That is not how it happened. I cannot believe that." You are listening to Partners in True Crime. We are your hosts, Rob and Cindy Dorfman. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts, even if it's one word. And please subscribe to our website, www.partnersintruecrime. Follow us on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram to check out our weekly promos. We're also now on YouTube at Partners in True Crime. If you subscribe to our website, you'll be getting weekly emails from us and all kinds of promotions and things that we don't advertise on the podcast. We're very excited to share this new podcast to all of our followers. It's one of the most amazing true crime stories and mysteries in the world. Ken Widener and Mike Lynch reached out to us about a month ago to tell us about the book they wrote that is coming out in May. Ken's uncles are John and Clarence Anglin. According to Ken, his uncles, along with Frank Morris, successfully escaped from Alcatraz prison in 1962. Even though the FBI and the U.S. Marshals' theory revolves around the idea that they never survived the escape, their bodies were never found, and it is still an unresolved case. Ken is convinced and has some proof that not only did they escape Alcatraz, but they made it to Rio de Janeiro to live out the remainder of their lives in Brazil. For this podcast, we're going to reveal all the details about John and Clarence, their upbringing, the bank robberies, and how they escaped multiple prisons before they even reached Alcatraz. And we'll also reveal how they had a lot of help from some infamous people in the true crime world. So let's get this unbelievable journey started and hear what they have to say. Okay, we're ready. All right. So we're really excited to start a new podcast with two really interesting gentlemen, and one which is a relative of two of the people who escaped Alcatraz Island. And for, I don't know anybody who doesn't know what Alcatraz is. And I don't know anybody who doesn't know about the famous escape from Alcatraz. There's been a lot of lore. There's been a lot of uh, myths about whether or not they actually made it. Uh, There's been a movie that Clint Eastwood made that, you know, used some of the elements, but wasn't completely accurate of what was going on. But it was an entertaining movie to kind of show if in fact someone could escape from Alcatraz Island, there's been a, a few documentaries about it. But on this podcast, we're going to hear it from the horse's mouth or a relative from the horse's mouth. We have Ken Widener and Mike Lynch. Ken is the the nephew, correct, of the two gentlemen that uh, escaped? That, that's correct. correct. Okay. And Mike Lynch is his uh, co-author of the book that's coming out mm-hmm. in yeah. May. So it's going to be available this May. And so during the run up to the promotion and when the book is launched we're going to be talking about this and we're going to be talking about it even after the launch because there's so much information about this there's a lot of theories and there's a lot of information that that both mike and ken have unearthed over the years and we're so excited to have them on here mike and ken thank you for being on the podcast and joining us on this journey through your childhood, Ken, and all your research, Mike. So before we get started, though, can you tell us the name of the book so everyone can look out for it when it's launched in May? Sure. Yeah. The, the name of the book is Alcatraz, The Last Escape. Okay, great. Uh, the, the, and and the, 
the name Last Escape, you know, most people would assume that we're referring to Alcatraz, but it does have a little twist to it. There was an escape attempt after uh, John and Clarence Anglin got off the prison, got out of the prison. It was uh, some months later. So it wasn't technically the last Alcatraz escape, but like Ken said, (laughs) it's discussing something else. Got it. Got it. So let's start off. Ken, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, your, your unique family background and your connection to the Anglin brothers And um, just tell us a little about yourself. Sure. So as you said, my uncles are John and Clarence uh, from my mother's side of the family. I first got introduced uh, to the Alcatraz story when I was uh, a year and a half old. I actually sat on my mom's lap as she watched the breaking news story of her two brothers as they were being plastered onto the screen, their wanted pictures. And I sat in her lap as we watched the story unfold on live TV. I physically never met John and Clarence. Now I did meet the third brother. There is actually three brothers that were involved in the bank robbery that we'll eventually kind of get into. But I did actually meet him before his death in prison also. My mom comes from a a large family of 14. John was number six in the lineup. Clarence was number seven, and my mother was number 10. So very large family. I have been experiencing Alcatraz all of my life. I probably didn't embrace it as much as as I did starting in 2012. You know, growing up as a teenager, you pretty much try not to be uh, someone who stands out in school. So I I didn't really kind of talk about my uh, past with my uncles until, like I said, 2012, which we we can talk about that in a few minutes. Did you meet your uncles? Did you know them? I never met John and Clarence. Like I said, I I was born in 1961. They were already in in Alcatraz at that time. Actually, Clarence showed up to Alcatraz uh, from Levensworth, where he had helped an escape plan with John. And he wound up showing up at Alcatraz just a a few weeks before I was born. So did I physically meet them? No, but I I knew all of the other family members, my aunts and uncles. And like I said, I, I did have the opportunity to be the last nephew to meet Alfred before his death in prison. Your family, I mean, having something like this happen in your family, it's tragic, but it's also, like you said, you didn't want the attention. So was it difficult for your mom and your family to deal with this over the years? How did they work through that? I would say it. the difficulty came from, at first, the FBI was very harsh on the family. Some of the stories that we can get into that I know happened. I know several FBI agents who came to our house well, as I grew up uh, questioning my mom over the number of years. And then eventually the U.S. Marshals took over and they we, we thought pretty much we had been left alone at that time. And you know, we find out years later that we were actually being surveilled. Uh, we were actually being followed and, and our phones were actually being tapped. You know, some people say, well, that's just, you know, you're just making that up. But we actually found out that actually happened. And even today, they they do keep tabs on some of us, which is pretty amazing. I mean, you know, it's 60 something years and the possibility of my uncle still being alive is very slim. They would be in their 90s and none of the Anglin brothers ever lived uh, to be that age. So yeah. uh, but it was it was hard on them, you know, because they of course, they Every time we got together every year for our England reunion, you know, they were missed uh, along with Alfred. And so it was a big hole in the family. I think over the years, they've they've come not so much to learn to not talk about it as they now like to share it. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, it's really something that we want to get out and tell the true story about what actually happened. Yeah. Well, let me just, uh, how did you and Mike connect and how long have you guys known each other? So. My, uh, and then I'll have Mike jump in. I, I can talk forever on this story, but, uh, <laughs> as you can tell. In 2012, I had a, it's really what turned to my kind of desire to, 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 to tell the story was in when I took my mom and her sister, the only two living relatives still left alive today, 
out to Alcatraz for the 50th anniversary. And while we were out there on the island, we were giving some interviews with some local news stations. And I I believe they were some from around the world that had set up the park rangers. And uh, at the table was the current U.S. Marshal that was working the case. And I was beside him, my mom and her sister. And then on the other side was a, a writer, a famous writer, for Alcatraz and one of the guards. And anyway, one of the, one of the individuals made a very disparaging comments about my uncles, you know, basically said, well, the whole thing was constructed by Frank Morris and John and Clarence were third great educated Hicks and they were lucky to be included. And I just got so mad. I said, that is not how it happened. I cannot believe that. So I made it my life mission to, to, write this story. And I originally started out in 2016 and I wrote a screenplay. And of course it really didn't, I was told it was looked at by Clint Eastwood and, you know, they said, well, it was very amateur, (laughs) which it probably was. I'm not a writer. And so somehow Mike had saw something that I had posted on uh, Facebook and he reached out to me and it took a, a number of years for him to convince me to because I was going to shelve the thing. I just wasn't going to do anything with it after being told that it, you know, it wasn't that great. And so Mike uh, took a look at it and he said, Hey, we can construct this into a really good book. And with his help, which I could not have done it without him, it's turned into what we have today. Mike, tell us a little bit about what you thought was unique about this idea and why you felt that this story needs to be told in a different way. So Ken was almost right about how we met. Got a little bit, not, <laughs> not quite the details correct, but I'll, I'll be happy to tell the truth here. Um, so, uh, when, um, when in 2015, three years after he did the, uh, the visitation to Alcatraz for the 50th anniversary, he did a TV documentary on the History Channel called Alcatraz Search for the Truth. And I, I've grown up in the Bay Area, so I'm very familiar with Alcatraz. I visited there in the early 80s. And then I also saw the Clint Eastwood movie in 79. And I, I also uh, have a passion for history. I was When I graduated from college, I was a history major. So I love history. And so growing up in the Alcatraz, you know, in the shadow of Alcatraz, you know, always wondering what, you know, whatever happened to those three, you know, a lot of people who live in the area, just, you know, you think about it, you wonder about it, you, you visit San Francisco and you see it, it, you know, it's right there in the Bay, you can't miss it. And of course, in the movie that Clint Eastwood did, you know, they leave the ending a little ambiguous, it sort of hints at that they survived, but of course, they don't come down either way, they just sort of, you know, lead up to that and just let the, you know, the uh, audience decide for themselves what happened. So again, it's just the ongoing question of did they make it or did they not make it? And then when I I uh, saw the the promo for the documentary that Ken had done. I hadn't met him. I didn't know who he was at the time. I thought, oh, you know, search for the truth. That sounds really interesting. And it was a two hour documentary. And, you know, he, he and his brother, David, met with Art Roderick, who was a uh, U.S. Marshal who had the case for a time. And then he was retired when they did the show. And Ken and his brother uh, produced a, a, the famous, now famous photograph of what they believed to be John and Clarence some years later, and some other documents that that indicated very strongly that they did survive and that they were still alive at the time. And I was just very intrigued by that. I thought, wow, here is some real evidence to show that they did make it. And in the, in the documentary, even Art was very impressed because he said, really, since the early 1960s, there really hadn't been any credible leads to John, Clarence, and Frank um, after the escape. You know, it, was, it basically has become a cold case. And when, he, when Ken and David produced that photograph, um, he was duly impressed. And so the, the remainder of the episode was examining some other pieces of evidence and uh, also trying to answer the question of what happened to um, Alfred when he died in prison in 1964 under very mysterious circumstances, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about in future future episode. Most definitely. And, uh, and so when I saw that, I thought, I, I just have to be a part of this. I have to be a part of this story. There's, there's, there's obviously a bigger story here. And so I reached out to Ken. I didn't know where he was. I, I was, I, you know, I just had to do a search for him on the internet. And I finally tracked him down through his, um, uh, uh, not TikTok. It was um, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> it wasn't Facebook. It wasn't your Facebook page. It was uh, um, your um, tweet. You, you had a tweet, a uh, Twitter account. Oh, okay. I found you on Twitter of all places and uh, reached out to you. I said, I'm a writer. I saw the story. I'd be interested in 
talking to you and then Ken responded and we uh, uh, we had a phone call, I believe it was. And he was very cordial, very nice about it, but he would politely said, you know, thank you for the offer, but I've got I've already got a script. I, under the advice of my lawyer, I shouldn't, I can't release any information to you. And, but thank you for reaching out. And, and I didn't realize at the time that Ken actually did not have a lawyer. He was just no. like, <laughs> very politely. Um, I, I was trying to be nice. Hollywood game. <laughs> Playing the yeah. Hollywood yeah. game. Yeah, you learned to be nice. Ken. Very fast learner. <laughs> so, and then, and so, and, and I do have, you know, obviously a writing background. I published books before. This isn't my first book. And I've, I have since branched out to screenplays. Um, and Ken had mentioned that he had written a screenplay about his uncles. And I said, well, you really have to be careful because when you send a screenplay to a producer or a director or, you know, whomever in the film industry, that script has to be good to go. It, it can't be mostly good or mostly ready. It has to be 100% because if it's not polished and, and ready, they're going to reject it. And so over the course of a year, I reached out to Ken from time to time because I wasn't going to give up on this and just sort of would check in with them saying, how's it going? How's the, uh, how's your, your, your plan to get this filmed? And, you know, he would just kind of like, oh, it's going okay. And just kept it short. And then after a year, he had sort of exhausted all of his possibilities of trying to get this thing produced, try to get it made. And he finally sent it to me, finally sent me the script thinking, well, maybe this guy can do something for me. He says, he's a screenwriter. Maybe he can help me out with this because everything I've tried hasn't worked. Now, what I also have learned in the meantime was that Ken wasn't sure if I was being honest with him about who I was because of prior experiences in his family of people who have purported to be supporters of the family and of the story and wanted to tell the story, but were really actually working for them for the marshals or, or associated with the marshals, trying mm -hmm. to get information right. from the family. And so they were using different duplicitous means to get the location of where the uncles were. Because they, the, the, the authorities have been convinced since the beginning, <clears throat> you know where they are, we know you're lying, we know you're covering for them. And if, you, if we find out that you are, you're going to prison. And they threatened mm -hmm. many times that way. And so they didn't know if I was one of those people. So Ken was naturally very guarded when I reached out to him saying, hey, I want to help you because they've been burned in the past before. But eventually yeah. I, I, I convinced him that I was who I was. And we decided to try to get a TV show produced and we worked on a script and then uh, which eventually led to the book. Fantastic. Yeah. There are some people who don't really know a lot about this story um, who are younger and didn't grow up with it. I mean, I went to college in San Francisco, so I, I know Alcatraz. I went there. I was fascinated with it. But there are people. So can you just give us a little bit of a background on the story without getting too deep into it, just so that people can we have a launching point for them. Yeah, just like a thumb, just for some of the younger audience yeah. that might not know who. Well, talking. you know, you know, that's at, at one time I I thought what, this is this is really kind of good for people who don't know the story because most people the only story they know about Alcatraz is either through the Clint Eastwood movie, which is not really kind of accurate. I mean, it, it was a great movie. I loved it. The family, my whole family loved watching it. Not very accurate. And, or either they go out to Alcatraz and they follow the narrative that the park rangers are telling people. So I really am excited that there are people that's going to read this book that have never heard, maybe never even heard of Alcatraz, because the book will start from the very beginning of how John and Clarence and Alfred uh, met people in their lives that later in life would aid them uh, in this escape. It is really kind of, when you read the book, it's really, and I know that I, I actually posted this on one of the websites, the romance website, websites, and I was asked like, are you sure you want to post this book on this site? And I was like, well, when you read it, you will actually find out it's a love story between John Anglin and his girlfriend, Helen. And from that back story of their life and how they interacted with some very important people, it's it's the stories that shaped them into the people that gave them the ability to escape from Alcatraz. Uh, because escaping from Alcatraz was no easy feat. And then for them to leave the country and never look back was also another hard piece of the story. But people are going to really, when they read the book, they're going to go away and they're going to say, okay, I've learned something that I've never knew about Alcatraz uh, and the people that were there. Can you tell so, me a little bit about what they were 
convicted of? Oh, sure. They were convicted of robbing a bank in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, in 1958, the early part of 1958. It was in Columbus, Alabama. C- Columbia, Alabama. Yeah. I'm, I'm so used to all these little spots. <laughs> they were tried in Montgomery. It was Columbia. That's right. Yeah, Montgomery. And, was um, yes. So, yeah, they, they robbed a bank. It was a re- very small town. They Some people have uh, thrown around different amounts. I've, I've actually heard they, they stole 12000 And then in the court documents, it said 19000 uh, which they recovered every bit of it. But yeah, so it was a bank robbery. And then from there, they were sent to federal prison. And I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit. That's the yeah. reason I like the book, because it goes into so much detail from previous day uh, a- escape attempts that they had tried in the federal prison system ultimately landed them in, Al- in Alcatraz. Yeah, the, the thing about Alcatraz <laughs> is that with one exception, um, Mickey Cohen, who was a famous L.A. mobster, and we'll, again, he, he, he's a part of the story we'll talk about later. But other than Mickey Cohen, the nobody was ever sent to Alcatraz, where if you were convicted of some a federal crime, you were sent to another <clears throat> federal prison. And so in the case of the brothers, they landed, John and Clarence landed in um, uh, Leavenworth in Kansas. And like Ken mentioned earlier, they tried to escape. And then usually what happened was if in a prison, in a federal prison, if you were a troublemaker, just causing difficulties for, for the for the administration or fellow inmates, or you tried to escape, that's when they sent you to Alcatraz. You were a problem inmate and Alcatraz was the end of the line uh, because Alcatraz had a reputation for being very harsh you had very few privileges. Everything had to be earned. I mean, other than a, a place to sleep and food and medicine, those are the only privileges you had and everything else had to be earned. And if you you know, broke the rules, they'd start taking your privileges away. And so Alcatraz had a very harsh reputation. And so that was where you went to be punished from you know, the prior prison. And that's what happened to John and Clarence. You know, they tried to escape from Leavenworth and then they were eventually, you know, landed at, at Alcatraz. And they met up with uh, Frank Morris, who was already there. And also the fourth man of the uh, the escape plot was Alan West, whom they'd previously known. And then there were others um, in the prison that were there as well that they they had previously known. So when, when they all got together at Alcatraz in, you know, late 60, early 61, and there, and because the prison population was relatively small, there were only about uh, uh, 250 inmates at any given time at Alcatraz. It went up and down a little bit, but that was generally the number. They all knew each other from prior incarcerations or associations over the years in the 50s. So they were not strangers. They they knew what they were like. They knew what skills they had. And because when you're pl- when you're planning an escape attempt in any prison, you have to you have to trust these people implicitly because the possibility of the information getting out would work against you. If if the escape was if the escape plan had been found out, they would have added two years to their sentence right off the bat, if not more, depending on right. the situation. Right. And so and there were snitches <clears throat> in the prisons that the guards were working with that other inmates would let guards know what was going on if there was a plan and you know being hatched because they would curry favor with the guards because they would either get privileges themselves or they would get their sentences <clears throat> reduced so you always had to be on guard with who you talk to because the, it could be the wrong person and and in again in the story uh with frank morris and alan west two of the other planners there's a history for them that is not a good history and there was some things that happened happen while they were planning, which we'll get into later, that affected Alan West's future as far as the escape goes. Of you know. Hey everyone, if you love reality shows and love to hear all pop culture insider news, you're going to love this podcast. The Sarah Fraser Show is a daily podcast covering pop culture, reality recaps like Sister Wives, 90 Day Fiance, and your favorite Bravo shows, plus guests of all kinds. You might learn something too, and a splash of Sarah's own personal life, hint. She's trying to have her second baby at 42 and shares every last detail about it, for better or worse. The Sarah Fraser Show has been featured in the New York Post, Daily Mail, and more. You might have seen Sarah recently on Lifetime's Married at First Sight kickoff and mid-season show with host Kevin Fraser. Check out The Sarah Fraser Show today wherever you listen to your podcasts. You know, he was the fourth man, but he didn't make it out. And there's a reason for that, which we will get into that is very interesting part of the story. So, but that's ultimately how they got there because of what they tried to do in Leavenworth, which, which started with the bank <coughs> robbery. I had no idea. It was just, two hundred. I thought it was more. That's tiny. Yeah. That's tiny. So I'm sure there was, everybody was 
really was intimate with everybody. They knew everybody inside there. Well, there were the four, but there were also others uh, involved that helped plan the escape. That they weren't they weren't a part of the escape itself, but they assisted in the escape um, because they had other other things that they were trying to do, and they didn't want to take the chance because the chance the, the the probability of them surviving the escape was very very low. For example, in in at Alcatraz, if if you were escaping and the guards saw you, they had orders of shoot to kill. No question. If you're trying to, if you're really going to run for it, you were going to be dead. And there were a number of Alcatraz inmates over the years who were shot and killed by the guards. And then, of course, then you have the the ocean or the the the, the bay, which was very treacherous, cold water, sharks. You know, the the tides were a terrible problem. Of you, know, you can't outswim the tides in the bay. And so many people believe that they drowned and that they were washed out into the ocean, never to be seen again. But you know, uh, something too to to remember about about John and Clarence. Clarence was actually already on the run from a previous escape when they robbed the bank in Alabama along with Alfred. So that's that's one of the reasons why they received five years more than what John did. But as far as escaping, Clarence had multiple escapes from Florida state prisons. He probably <laughs> at least a dozen. And like I said, he was already on the run uh, along with his brother who had been out for almost like five years on the run. He had escaped one of the uh, Florida state prisons. So, you know, these escapes were not something that they, that was new to them. They were, I would say they're probably expert escape artists. And when they, when they got convicted in Alabama on the state charges, there's an entry in one of the uh, FBI files where something occurred. There was some suspicion. I, I would assume that John and Clarence, or at least Clarence, was probably already planning something and either attempted something and it delayed his his uh, being transferred out to Levensworth. And to correct something, you know, that Mike uh, said, when they originally left Alabama on their state prison, they sent Alfred back to Atlanta to do his federal time. And they sent uh, John to Lewisburg where he attempted an escape and they had sent Clarence to Levensworth. Well, when John tried to escape from Lewisburg, they sent him over to, to, to Levensworth. And then the two of them together hot, uh, tried to hatch a, an escape plan and got caught. John wound up going straight from there to Alcatraz and then uh, Clarence followed uh, shortly after, a few months after, and showed up there in um, January in 61. But as far as like Mike said, when you watch the movie like the Escape from Alcatraz, you think, well, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, it's the first time they met, but they actually knew each other. They, from uh, spending time in, in a Florida prison, uh, all four of them knew each other, which was really amazing. It, there, it was something that they all had experience at, and they, uh, they put those escape minds together, and they pulled off one of the greatest prison escapes of all time. It's crazy. I mean, I just think about the two things I think people are really fascinated in the crime world are bank robberies, bank heists. We just had a huge one down here in L.A. over Easter weekend, 30 million they robbed from this. Oh, uh, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. 30 million, and they didn't even realize it was you know, no alarm stripped or anything. And the experts are saying they're going to get away with it. They're, there's because there's no, they can't track the money. So you have that and prison escapes, okay? Right. Prison escapes, I mean, going all the way down to like, I mean, to me, one of my favorite movies is Papillon, you know, which yes. has oh, that yeah. same, that movie, same kind yeah. of Alcatraz, <laughs> European version of Escape from Alcatraz. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Or the other one, uh, Midnight mm -hmm. Express. Yes. You know, who, yeah. you know, actually, I know uh, the guy who actually escaped from that prison. He's actually here in LA. It's just so fascinating. And the fact that the type of personality that you have to be in order to kind of hatch a plan like that, you, you can't be dumb. You gotta be smart. No. You, gotta no. be, you gotta have your shit together to really kind of be able to come up and have that uh, fortitude and that tenacity and also the genius of coming up with yes. how you're going to how you and how to engineer how you're going to do it and how you're going to the timing and all these things that have to come into play in order for it to happen, you know, just the creating those dummy bodies and get knowing how to get into those air vent systems and the timing of the the lights and the guard shifts and who's watching and you know and the fact that you said that the there was a lot of people in the prison other inmates that might have known about it who supported it who weren't snitches they were all part of your uncle's escaping and it just it's so yes. fascinating how th those kind of plans kind of 
come to fruition and what goes on in their mind as they're sitting in their cell and the fact that they had all this experience prior to getting out of prison. I mean, it's like, it's crazy. Just Well, that, that's the reason I said that, you know, in this book, when we take you back to the very beginning, John and Clarence, like I said, they grew up in a family of 14. My grandmother and grandfather were extremely poor. Yeah, if you think of poor today, multiply that by a hundred. And that's what they were. To give you just a little small picture, they lived in a four room house, not a four bedroom, a four room house. It had no running water. It had no electricity. The windows only had shutters. They took baths on the back porch with water that they used to wash clothes in. There was a wooden stove that they cooked off of. And so this is the kind of environment, I mean, they were extremely poor. I mean, I can't even, I can't even stress how poor these, these people were. But in that environment, they learned how to create stuff from nothing because they didn't have anything. And so my mom used to tell me about how they built a car. They made bicycles. They, uh, they created toys for the other siblings that they had to watch. They always inventing stuff. I used to say when I learned about some of the things that they constructed that John was like the MacGyver of the 1950s and 40s. He could take anything and you would think, oh, it's a piece of trash, it's no good. And he would turn it into something useful. And so those skills, I believe, is what they relied upon when they were in Alcatraz. Because like you said, they can't just go down to the hardware store and pick up a wrench if they needed the wrench, you know, or if they need a flashlight. I mean, some of the things that they found after the escape, the FBI said it was just mind blowing. I mean, they made a homemade flashlight. They made a periscope. They made tools. And all of these were, all of these were constructed from the, you know, from the past of things that they had done before. Even like the dummy heads. Believe it or not, that wasn't the first time John and them had ever used dummy heads. So they used to use it when they were kids <laughs> to sneak out of the house and their dad wouldn't be able to catch them <laughs> when they were gone. So. It, you know, they were they were relying upon things that they grew up with that aided them in this escape. I think it's so interesting and so true because we're so used to having everything at our disposal. You know, you don't realize right. how poor people were back then and how they had to become creative just to survive. You take you're, all those skills correct. and then you take these people that meet like by fate in a prison before this and then they meet again and they all mm -hmm. have the common goal of escaping. It's It's just like fate brought all these people together. It's fascinating. Yeah, well, they always say that once you go to prison the first time, and then then that's where you learn how to become a real criminal is inside those bars because you start meeting all these other criminals and you know bank robbers, thieves, and and you know you learn the the skills of the trade, and you when you get out, then you just keep on using them. But Alcatraz is in the middle of the San Francisco Bay, and it is cold and scary water. There's sharks everywhere. I mean, we'd go on a sailboat, and you'd see a great white shark go right by. I mean, it's, but, it's that kind of environment. But you know, I used to, I used to think the same thing that how scary it was and shark infested. But I did the 2016 Escape from Alcatraz triathlon, Oof. and they they drop you, they drop to every single year, they drop two thousand people in the water. And we swam from the top side of of Alcatraz all the way to Marina Green which is a mile wow. and a half. Was I a little nervous? Of course I was, but it's just proof that, and we swam at the exact same time frame, which was June, around June the 11th. That's usually when they schedule it, but it's proof that if they had a need to swim, and, and my two uncles were great swimmers. Huh? If they had the need to swim, they could have swam to shore. Right. When I did the race that year, there were uh, several people, I, I'm assuming they were veterans, but there were two people that only had one arm and swam across it. I saw people who didn't even wear wetsuits. I wore a wetsuit, you know, it was, it was a little chilly, but there was even a blind individual who swam it with a guide. So I'm not going, if, if these people have the ability to do it, I can promise you my two uncles, if they had to have swam, they could have done it easily. Really so to convince me that they got out there and something happened and they panicked and they drowned, I just, knowing the stories that I know about my uncles, that did not happen. Don't you think they would have found them if that happened? I mean, of course. I mean, all three I of them, all three of them had 
life preservers that they created own. And the one that they did find, or actually two, but one of the ones that they found, which had a cut in it, they patched it. Uh, and this is in the FBI files. They filled it full of air and they set weights on top of it and it held air for over an hour. And they even commented in the FBI file, it could have been maintained for a long period of time if you had just blew into the straw. So then they took the boat that they left behind because there was actually two rafts. There was a smaller one that they had constructed and they took it and inflated it, set weights on it, and it stayed inflated for hours. So this notion that, like you said, if if something had happened and they drowned and they all were wearing uh, life preservers that they created, then where are they? How come no one found them? This must drove the, the FBI and U.S. Marshals crazy, you know? Well, crazy. I, I think when you read this book, you're going to find out that, and I've always believed this myself, the FBI and the federal marshals have always known where they went. When you read this book, there is no way in hell that they did not know. If if someone like me and Mike, and I'm not saying that we're dumb, but I'm just saying if an if an amateur person like me and and Mike's a professional writer, but if we're able to dig through this and find this information, you cannot tell me that these professionals did not know this. Yeah. There was a reason why they wanted them to stay gone. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like I was saying, I was going to say that because we deal with law enforcement all the time on these cases. And, and you know, we're pro law enforcement, huge, huge supporters. But there's an element sometimes when they have if they, they don't want to have any egg on their face. So they're they're better off sweeping things under the rug as opposed to letting the truth come out because it, it's only going to make them look worse off. And so I think that has a lot to do with it. And, you know, not that they don't want to do their job, but it's just like there's not resources to continue looking for this. These people, your uncles weren't harming anybody. From what we know, they weren't killers. You know, they were I don't bank- believe they ever killed any of that yeah. I'm aware of. But Well, when, when they robbed the bank in Alabama in 58, John actually had to be convinced. He didn't want to do it because of the danger, obviously. When you rob a bank, that's because they were small time petty criminals. They broke into houses. They stole cars. You know, they, they stole from stores. You know, they were small timers. And then when they decided to rob the bank and they had their reasons of why they did that, which we'll get into later, John, the only way that he would do it is if they, he didn't want to use a real gun so they used a toy gun that looked like a real one and we have a picture of it in the book and when they when they were in the midst of robbing the bank there was a pregnant woman who was there who fainted and Clarence rushed over to her in the middle of the robbery to make sure she was okay and gave her some water. And when when she was fine and they got the money, that's when they you know they took off in the car and drove off. So they they didn't want to hurt anybody. They never did. They were they were never they were never violent men. They were just basically thieves. No. That's that was sort of their their criminality. And and so they wanted the money. That's all they were concerned about. They didn't want to hurt anybody. And I also just want to mention one other thing, going back to the to the raft and them escaping. Uh, two years ago, Ken and I were on a show, Expedition Unknown, that was uh, it was about the Alcatraz escape. And one of the things that we did in the show was we recreated the raft scene, for the, you know, because you know they were in the raft and that the raft was being towed by a boat across the bay. And on the day that we filmed that, the water was very, very bad. It was very choppy, a lot of waves, a lot of wind. It was Six very- Six seas. Yeah, it was very bad weather. And they're being towed, Ken and uh, the host of the show and uh, an ex FBI agent were in the boat recreating the escape. And at one point the host, Josh Gates, fell out of the raft and was able to climb back into the raft pretty easily. I mean, they had to be, he had to be pulled in, but they, he got yeah, back to the raft pretty easily <laughs> and then, you know, made it across the bay to the, you know, to the, where the piers are in San Francisco. Well, the night of the escape, the water was very calm. It was a calm night. There was a little bit of fog, but no, you know, the weather was not bad at all. So even if one of the three fell into the water, they would have been able to get back in pretty quickly and easily. It wasn't hard. So the idea that somehow all three of them fell in is very unlikely. And, and like Ken said, even if they did, they were, you know, because in the show, they, they were just wearing wetsuits. They weren't wearing life preservers. And and like I said, they got Josh in back in pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, but the night of the escape, they were wearing life preserves. So even if one or more of them fell in, they'd still be able to float. So again, it just, when we, you know, recreating this, recreating what happened showed that the likelihood of them drowning is near zero 
It just wasn't, right. it just wouldn't be possible with all the precautions that they took. And one of the things we're going to love about doing this podcast with y'all is that in some future episodes, we want to really dig into and explain when I say they always knew where they were at. And if you don't follow every lead that comes your way in the very beginning of the escape, I mean, right after the escape, if you don't follow the good leads that are there and you toss them aside and you actually try to tell the people that have the big leads of what happened, that they didn't see what they saw and how can we make this go away? If you're trying to find somebody, why would you not follow every credible lead, especially if it comes from law enforcement? Yeah. And what I found most intriguing was that in a newspaper article we came across, the rank and file of the FBI actually believed some of these, they, they actually said, yes, this is credible. We want to follow this. But the upper management wanted to shut it down. They did not want them following these leads. And so I go back to what I said earlier. Why do they want to shut this down? Why is it that they would follow every other lead, you know, from, well, okay, we'll go into some more detail about it, but it's, yeah. it's definitely something there that we bring out in this book that proves that some of this stuff was staged by the authorities and they purposely ignored credible leads that probably could have caught them fairly early. You know, one of the things about you, you mentioned earlier about there is a, had been a lot of uh, escapes, you know, famous escapes throughout our history, even some in the, in the past 20 years here. But one of the things that most of them have in common is that they catch the people fairly quick. Mm -hmm. And that's because if, and I agree with, I had a debate with one of the marshals, if they did not have a plan when they got to that water and they didn't have help and all they were going to do is just make it to the shore and, and make a run for it, they would have been caught before two days. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have, I mean, you got to survive. You got to be able to eat. You've got to be able to have clothes. Yeah, you might rob a couple of stores, but at some point in time, you're going to get caught. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at what happened so, in upstate New York. They got caught. Exactly. They were running. They got the, caught very fast. And the fact that they did not get caught, to me, is proof that they had help. And we have documentation on the, on who helped them, but help them get out of the country. And that is one of the reasons why you never, they never got caught doing anything else because they're not here anymore. Yeah. They pretty much, when they left the U S they left the U S for good. Yeah. And I think that leads us up to the point where we're going to be talking about a lot of the quote unquote kind of conspiracy theories of how they got out. And I, I think some of them, you, these theories, both you and Mike can prove and, yes. uh, you know, and bona fide. And so that's going to be really interesting to hear all of that stuff because I've heard the story just based upon our preliminary interviews. And I'm, I'm going to tell our listeners, you're not going to believe what you're going to hear. It's so, it it's goes, such an amazing story. I mean, it's just deep. <laughs> it's really deep. Yeah. You know, th there's a lot of familiar names that come up that you're going to be kind of shocked of. And, and that time of that time of in the United States, the early sixties, you had a lot of stuff going on. You know, you had, you know, the civil rights thing was going on. You had JFK, you had, you know, there's a lot of things going on in this country. Very turbulent times, much like what we're dealing with today. And yeah. so it's going to be interesting to really kind of unpack all of that information through both of your work. And it's just, I think it's fascinating that, that you, you have such a kind of unique family history connected to this seminal event that, you know, that is, that's crazy. I mean, we all have, we all like, I'm very interested in my family history. I'm like the only one in my family, very interested in my family history. And, Me too. and we've gone back and we, we're constantly going back, but nothing as interesting as what went on in your family history <laughs> uh, but still it's it's but what also is interesting to me is the charge like if you look at today like kids that are listening to this or younger people they're looking at people just walking out getting caught by police being charged and then walking out with no repercussions and here are these right. two guys who didn't, didn't kill anybody no they just robbed a bank and they right. were put in like a high federal maximum security prison oh well, when we get into the actual, which I'm going to love the chapter that is around the trial, the federal and the state trial, they actually wanted to give them the death penalty in the state of Alabama for the state charges. Wow. Uh, is a very incredible. They only, when we get to the story, and I'll leave that for another episode, but it is amazing 
what happened to them in the federal judicial judicial system. It, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I want to go. Yeah. I don't want to give someone and then they go away. And go. Oh, I don't understand what he's talking about. We want to exactly. go into some really, really good detail <laughs> about this because let's, this is really they, amazing. Let's just say they they were railroaded and the criminal justice system came yes. down on them hard yes. and uh, took advantage of their inability to have a proper defense. Um, because of their, like Ken said, they were very, very poor. So the first trial, they had a public defender who was friends with the judge. So you can imagine how that would go. Yeah, we've, we've seen <laughs> that before. We, we're, we're working on that right now with somebody. So. That's who we just got to check. It, it's, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it's uh, it, what happened to them judiciously is just remarkable. That would it would never happen today. But this is in the no. South. Oh, it's happening. It, it happens. It's happening. It's happening right now. <laughs> well, You'd be surprised this what's happening. This was the late 1950s, and there was a whole nother, yeah. whole nother standard back then. Oh, I'm yeah, sure. yeah, that was. Yeah. Way I mean, you can, you could almost picture the courthouse. You know, like you would see uh, in the old, in the 1950s with no windows and the shutters are open and it's <laughs> smoky. You know, environment. That's pretty much about what what they what they faced when it came to Alabama. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, we'll 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 discuss that in in some great detail, well, and and especially when we get to the Alfred piece of the story. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's so much stuff to talk about, but I think I think yes. for our first episode here, kind of kicking this off, it's a great place to end. We I think we've whetted the audience's appetite to what's coming down the road here, and I'm I'm telling everybody, you're not going to believe what you hear about this story and you can, you know, like I said, this, the book is going to be, it's just going to blow things open and we're, it's amazing. we're excited to kind of highlight it here on the podcast. And so every fr- every Thursday now people can uh, tune in and listen and hear Mike and Ken tell this fabulous tale. And it's almost, it's not even a myth because the way they're going to be presenting it, they, they have all the information. So thanks guys for sharing this with us. We're uh, excited to sh- share this journey with you through, through your book and explaining what happened to your uncles? And I can't wait to hear more about your uncles, man. They sound fascinating. <laughs> I can't wait to share them. Yeah, right. cool. Over to it myself. Please visit our website where you can subscribe to the podcast, find show notes, and check out extra content from all of our podcasts. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content.